Today we will be reading Luke chapter 5, verses 27 through 39. That's Luke chapter 5, verses 27 through 39. Will you please stand as we read these verses? I will read the first verse and ask that you join in with me on the second verse and continue with me every other verse. Luke chapter 5, verses 27 through 29. And after these things he went forth and saw a publican named Levi sitting at the receipt of customs. And he said unto him, Follow me. And he left and rose up and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his own house. And there was a great company of publicans and of others that sat down with them. But their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do ye eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answering said unto them that they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but to sinners to repentance. And they said unto him, Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers? And likewise the disciples of the Pharisees, but thine eat and drink. And he said unto them, Can ye make the children of the bride chamber fast? while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. And he spake unto them, No man put up a piece of a new garment upon an old. If otherwise, then both the new maketh a rent, and the piece that was taken out of the new agreed not with the old. And no man put up new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottle. And he spilled, and the bottle shall perish. But new wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved. No man also hath drunk and wine straight, uh, old wine straightway of desire new. For he saith, the old is better. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day of life. We thank you for the church. We thank you for your graciousness. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your obedience to the Father. And we ask that your blessing be upon our pastor as he delivers his message. All this we ask in our Lord Savior's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, this morning we are continuing our study of the Gospel of Luke. And we are concluding the fifth chapter. We began this study, I was thinking about this back in March. And so some of you have uh, given me a little bit of grief about how slow we're going through Luke. And so I thought this morning I would recommend we change the name of the sermon series from Journey with Jesus to Lollygagging Through Luke. I don't know what you all think about that. But today we're going to look at uh, the calling of Levi and the arguments between Jesus and the Pharisees that come as a result of that. So we're kind of combining a few stories to get through the end of this chapter this week. And we start in verse 27 where Luke writes this. After these things, he went forth, Jesus, and saw a publican named Levi. By the way, Levi is the same uh, person as Matthew. It's just two different names, kind of like Simon is also Peter. Thomas is also Didymus. Uh, some of them have two names like that. So Levi is Matthew, the one who wrote the Gospel of Matthew. And, and he saw Levi sitting at the receipt of custom. That means uh, basically a tax booth. If you think about in our day and age, it would be something similar to a toll booth where people would travel through from one place to another and uh, someone would sit there and basically collect a tariff on any goods that were coming in or out of the city. So he was sitting there at the receipt of custom and Jesus said unto him, follow me. And he left all, rose up and followed him. The tax collectors and the publicans, which is the same group of people, the publicans are simply those who collected taxes or tariffs of the people. They were hated by the Jews, not only because they had to pay taxes to them, but because they were Jewish men who were collecting taxes from their fellow Jews and giving them to the Romans who were occupying Israel at the time. So they were seen as traitors. Uh, these were Jewish men who basically, in order, the Roman Empire uh, franchised out their taxes so that somebody who had enough money to buy a tax franchise over a certain area uh, could do so. So you had to have a little bit of money to get into the tax collecting business to begin with. But once you got in there, it was a, a real money maker. Uh, tax collectors had a bad reputation because they tended to be dishonest with their dealings. They would overcharge the people. They would charge them more than what the Roman government was enforcing, and then they would pocket the rest. 
And so these men were basically extortioners, getting rich at the expense of their neighbors. They were hated men. They were traitors. They were thieves. If you remember, if you were uh, with us back in Luke 3 when John the Baptist was preaching about repentance and tax collectors came unto him and they asked him, what, what should we do? What, do what, what sort of repentance do we need to have? And he said, stop charging people more than you're, you're required to because it was such a common practice that they would uh, rip off their fellow countrymen. So they were seen as traitors, traitors to Israel because they were collecting taxes for the enemy, the Romans, uh, and they were seen as just dishonest thieves. These were the worst of sinners in their day, at least that's how they were considered. A tax collector's testimony wasn't even allowed in court. They were considered so untrustworthy that uh, their testimony just didn't matter. It would be scandalizing then that Jesus would choose such a man like Levi to become one of his disciples. Levi may have been the most hated man in Capernaum. But this shows us how Jesus is. This shows us how the kingdom of God works. God doesn't look for righteous people to become his followers. He chooses sinners, those who know they're broken and sinful people. Jesus delights in saying to such people, follow me. If you're here this morning, you feel like you're too much of a sinner for God to be gracious to, then you've misunderstood what grace is. I have a quote here from Richard Sibbs, a Puritan. He said, there is more mercy in Christ than sin in us. I think that's a very good synopsis of the, really the ministry of Christ. He took vile sinners, those who were hated by society, and transformed them into citizens of the kingdom of God. That's the scandal of God's grace. And after leaving everything behind, Levi begins to follow Jesus. He throws a party at his house, uh, presumably maybe the next day or some, somewhere right after, and he invites all of his tax collector friends to come and meet Jesus. See this in verse 29. Levi made a great feast in his own house, and there was a great company of publicans and others that sat down with them. But their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So this, these self-righteous scribes and Pharisees that we've talked about quite a bit over the last few weeks, they came to Jesus' disciples, and they first asked, why is this, this teacher, why is this uh, Jesus associating with such sinful people? And Jesus' answer shows us his heart. He had come to, make, uh, to, to help sinners repent. And if these were indeed the worst of all sinners, then these were the ones who were most in need of a physician. He gives that analogy of a doctor with sick people. You don't ask a doctor, why are you hanging out with sick people? No, that's his job. His job is to help them. And that's what Jesus saw himself as, a, a spiritual physician who was helping sinners to repent. And the scribes and Pharisees, they weren't actually righteous. We saw this a few weeks ago. They were sinners as well, but they thought of themselves as righteous. Uh, they didn't see themselves as sinners like these tax collectors. Jesus came to those who were spiritually sick because they have the need and will respond to the offer of help. A person who thinks that they're well won't seek treatment. He sought those who knew who they were, and he taught them to, be, to repent and be transformed by the power of God. So in other words, the gospel is not for good people. It's for people who know just how bad they are. And once again, we're reminded of the reason Jesus came. He came to call sinners to repent. We saw this last week. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. He had come to call these sinners, and this meal with the tax collectors was part of his reaching out to those who knew they were sinners and calling them to turn from their sin and be forgiven. Jesus didn't come for those who thought they were righteous. He came for those who knew they were sinners, and he came to call them to repentance, not to participate in their sin. Uh, that's what the Pharisees sort of thought. You need to keep a distance. You need to separate from sinful people. Jesus said, no, I'm going to go after those sinful people, and I'm going to help them. See, in uh, Matthew 21, Jesus said this to the Pharisees, But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Go, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. And he came to the second and said likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Whether of the twain did the will of his father? They say unto him, The first. Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you that the publicans and the harlots, that's prostitutes, go into the kingdom of God before you. This was such a, a just strong statement by Jesus. That the worst of sinners, the people you think of as the absolute lowest of the low, they're going to enter the kingdom of God before you Pharisees. No one's righteous enough to earn access into God's kingdom, but 
the sinner, in a sense, is actually closer to the kingdom than the Pharisee because the, the sinner knows that he's a sinner. His next step is to repent. The Pharisee first has to be convinced of his own sinfulness before he can then repent. And that's, I think, the point of this. The Pharisees thought of themselves as righteous people, not needing repentance. They were blind to their own sin. They were like the, the person who says, I'll, okay, I'll go in the field, and they're not going. Whereas the sinner knows that he's in disobedience, and he has to just simply repent and turn from that. These people are self-deceived, thinking that they're living righteously. They're saying, I'm going, and yet they're not. And Jesus says on Judgment Day, many of these Pharisees will be surprised to see those they thought of as sinners entering the kingdom while they themselves are being denied entrance. Because ultimately, it doesn't matter how grievous your sin is, God stands willing and ready to forgive anyone who repents. Uh, Paul wrote of this in the book of 1 Timothy. He said, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that, Je that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Jesus came for sinners. We see starting in verse 33 that the Pharisees had another problem with Jesus attending this party. It wasn't just the associations, but he, he had a, they had a problem with the very fact that Jesus and his disciples were eating and drinking on this particular day. We'll explain that in a moment. First, we'll read verse 33. This is, again, the Pharisees and uh, the scribes are saying to Jesus, Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers? And likewise, the disciples of the Pharisees, but thine eat and drink. The disciples of John the Baptist and of the Pharisees fasted regularly. Now, in the Old Testament, there's only one day that you're actually required to fast. That's Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, that all Jews are supposed to fast on that particular day. Uh, but the Pharisees had basically set up this system where you had to fast twice a week on Mondays and Thursdays. And that was their, their ritual of fasting. Uh, you remember this, the story of the, the Pharisee and the publican. We'll not look at this right now. But he, he's praying to himself and he says, I thank thee that I'm not like the sinner. I fast twice in the week. Uh, that's an indication of this practice that goes back all the way to the time of Jesus. Where they would fast twice a week, basically to show their piety to show how righteous they were and how, how holy before God they were. They would fast on Mondays and Thursdays. That became the standard. If you wanted to prove how righteous you were, you fasted every Monday and Thursday. And so I think what's happening here is they're criticizing Jesus, likely because uh, Levi's feast took place on a Monday or a Thursday. And they're saying, what, what are you doing eating here? This is Monday. You're not supposed to be eating. Jesus answers their response in verse 34. He says, Can you make the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then they shall fast in those days. Jesus is inviting the Pharisees to see who he was. They should be rejoicing that the Messiah has come. The prophecies, uh, the prophecies of the Old Testament had been fulfilled, and the long-awaited kingdom of God had arrived. This was a time for rejoicing, not a time for solemnity and fasting. But the Pharisees at this point, they're fasting twice a week really just for the sake of doing so. If you would have asked a Pharisee, why are you fasting today? Uh, my guess is the answer would have been, well, it's, it's Thursday. That, that's what we do. There wasn't really a reason behind it. They weren't fasting because they wanted to humble themselves before the Lord. It was just a ritual. And I think if we're not careful, we can get into some of these same practices ourselves. If I were to ask you, why did you come to church today? I hope the answer is not because it's Sunday. Uh, that's what we do on Sundays. No, we come to church to worship God. We come to church to learn his word. And when something becomes just a practice and a ritual without any real reason behind it, uh, we, we can be in danger of basically just getting into mindless traditions like the Pharisees. There's nothing wrong with fasting twice a week, but it, it becomes a problem when you expect, first of all, everybody else to abide by your standard. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. It also becomes a problem when there's just no heart behind it. It's just an action that you do to look good to others. Jesus mentions here that there's coming a time when he would leave the earth, and then the followers of Jesus would fast and pray. And as we see our broken world falling around apart us, I think this should drive us as Christians to our knees. Uh, prayer and fasting are two of the most neglected spiritual disciplines in 21st century American Christianity. Uh, when was the last time you fasted? We attend church religiously. We may even read the Bible daily. But when was the last time we prayed for more than 30 seconds before a meal? When was the last time we fasted? It was Jesus' expectation that his true followers would regularly fast and pray after he left. Our text concludes with a strange parable, and this is uh, the first of the parables that we've encountered 
in the book of Luke so far. So I want to give a little bit of a, an explanation of what this word parable means. Maybe you've heard about this. Literally in Greek, it means to throw alongside. Uh, so Jesus is teaching something, and he throws a story alongside to sort of explain it. But these stories, they're, they're used as tools to help Jesus make a point. And in some ways, they make things clearer, but often they actually are really difficult to figure out. It's not like Aesop's fable, where he gives you a story and you know right away the, the application is pretty straightforward. No, Jesus are a little bit more complex than that. He would give a story that, at first, you probably wouldn't understand, and then you go home and you think about it for a while, and as you ruminate on it, it sort of starts to make sense. And it, it's a way of, of clarifying something, but it, it's very, uh, a very sophisticated method of teaching, because it really gets you thinking. The more you think and meditate on these parables, the more clarity you have about the underlying truth Jesus was trying to get across. So today we start with the parable in verse 36. We're going to see many of these as we go throughout Luke's gospel, but this is the first one. It says, He spake also a parable unto them. So he's speaking to these scribes, to these Pharisees, and he says, No man putteth a piece of a new garment upon an old. If otherwise, then both the new maketh a rent, and the piece that was taken out of the new agreeeth not with the old. Let me modernize the English for you there. Jesus is saying, nobody, if you have a hole in an old uh, pair of pants that you have, you don't take a new pair of pants, rip a piece out of that, and put it on the old. Because if you do, first of all, you've ruined your new pair of pants. And secondly, it doesn't match the old pair. You've ruined both. He continues the uh, same concept with a different illustration in verse 37. He says, No man putteth new wine into old bottles. Bottles is not a great translation there. It should be wine skins. Uh, literally, it's, it's like they would take goat skins and uh, kind of a gruesome process, but basically they would turn the goat into a container for their wine. And uh, it says, Nobody puts new wine into old bottles or, or old wine skins, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. Now, let me explain this just a little bit. Wine skins were made of animal skin or leather. They were used to store wine. And as new wine fermented, it expanded, which would stretch the wine skin. So putting new wine into an old wine skin, which had already been stretched, would result in the bursting of the skin. Uh, when the new wine started to ferment. And so it would burst the skin, the wine would be spilled on the floor and ruined, and the skin would be ruined because now it has holes in it or it, it's ripped apart. So by placing new wine in old skins, you ruin both the skins which break and the wine which spills. Verse 38, the, but new wine must be put into new bottles and both are preserved. And then verse 39, he concludes by saying, no man also having drunk old wine straightway desireth new, for he saith, the old is better. Now, did you get all that? Uh, the meaning of the parable seems to be that Jesus' teaching was something new. And with this inauguration of the new, the old passes away. You can't just combine the old system of Judaism with the, G the Jesus movement. He didn't come just to put a patch on the Jewish traditions. His movement was a new thing altogether. And trying to enforce the rules of legalistic Judaism on the followers of Jesus wouldn't work. It's like taking a piece of cloth and putting it on another. It just doesn't, it doesn't work. The last statement about no one who has tasted old wine wants new wine, I think that's Jesus' way of saying these religious leaders were satisfied with the old form of Judaism. They were content to keep living in these rules and traditions, this really dead form of Judaism. And those who are thus satisfied with what they have, they don't seek anything new. If this is all you've ever experienced, then you, you don't want the new thing. You want to stay in the old paths that you're used to. God had brought the kingdom in Jesus, and those who were of the religious crowd of Jesus' day didn't want to be a part of it. They were satisfied with the old system. So Jesus was reaching out to new people. He was putting new wine in new wineskins, and the tax collectors and sinners were those new people. They would gladly receive this good news of forgiveness. They weren't the, zeal uh, the religious zealots who were so fixed in their ways and traditions to change, but these sinners, these publicans, would happily accept the opportunity to be a part of this new movement of God. And one such candidate is Levi, a tax collector, a man who is looked down upon by all for his profession. But when Jesus tells Levi to come and follow him, he happily left everything behind to become a follower of Christ. The Pharisees and the scribes would have never done such a thing because they loved their life already. They were very happy with their system and they were unwilling to give it up to follow Christ. So I want to kind of look back on this text and just ask a few questions. First, what does it mean to follow Jesus? How can a sinner become a disciple of Christ? 
I think we see, in it, first of all, in the example of Levi, that a sinner must be willing to give up his life to Christ. Following Jesus means, in essence, signing a blank check and letting Jesus do with your life as he will. And that's, that's only a hard decision if we don't truly believe the Bible. If we believe that Jesus is God, that he has all the wisdom in the world, that he loves us, uh, why wouldn't we be willing to do what he says? Why wouldn't we be willing to give our lives to him? I think when we, when we wrestle with God and we try to keep control of our life to ourselves, it shows us something about what we believe about God, that we know better how to live our life than he does. But Jesus calls us to leave everything behind, to lose your life in order to find it. That's the paradox of the kingdom of God. Matthew lost his career, but he gained his destiny. Secondly, becoming a follower of Jesus means repenting of sins. We see Jesus came for sinners, but he didn't come just so they could uh, stay in their sin and he could hang out with them. No, he came to call them to repentance. Those who knew they were lost, those who consider themselves to be unworthy of God's grace, those are the ones Jesus came to, not to leave them in that state, but to pull them out. He calls sinners to repent. And repentance is not a one-time thing. Maybe you've repented when you got saved, but uh, Luther said that uh, uh, a Christian life is one of continuous repentance, and it's so true. Uh, over and over again, we have to continually uh, look into Scripture and compare our lives to the standard and say, are, are we doing all that we ought to do? Have we written that blank check and then taken it out of Jesus' hands again? Uh, has God at one time ruled on your, your heart's throne and then you kicked him off? That's what happens over and over, and so we have to continually repent. Lastly, becoming a follower of Jesus means turning from false systems of belief and trusting solely in Christ. You must abandon any hope of God's favor on the basis of good works. This is the problem the Pharisees had. You can't add Jesus as a patch on the garment of your religion. Jesus calls you to leave your religion behind and follow him. Uh, Paul understood this. Paul was a Pharisee. We talked about this before. And he left that system and trusted in Christ alone to save him. We see this in Philippians 3 where Paul writes, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he may trust in the flesh, I more, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Following Jesus means leaving your religiosity behind, leaving your good works behind. It also means leaving your sin behind. And as we see in the life of Levi, it means leaving your life behind. It may even mean leaving your career behind, as it did with Matthew. To those who are feeling guilty of sin, I urge you to look to Christ and see his mercy. He came for sinners like you. To those who feel nothing, thinking you're not that bad of a person, I urge you to look at yourself and see your own sinfulness. You may not have the outward, obvious manifestations of sin like others that you think are inferior, but God sees your heart. He sees every ugly thought you've had toward another person made in God's image. He sees every proud word, every lie you've ever told. He sees every impure motive behind even your seemingly good deeds. Jesus knows it all, and he stands ready to forgive if you will but see your sin and call out to him for mercy. Jesus came to save sinners, sinners like the tax collectors and sinners like the self-righteous Pharisees. He came to call sinners to repent and to be forgiven. I want to transition at this point really to our church corporately and just make a few applications. First of all, I want you to think about the first time you stepped foot in our church. Some of you grew up in church backgrounds like I did, so you may have not had this experience. But a lot of people, when they come into a church for the first time, they think, oh, these people have it all together. I don't think I fit in here. Now, if you've been here for a while, you know that's not true. And let me be the first to tell you, the more you get to know me, the more you'll realize that's not true. Just ask my wife. Uh, anybody who thinks that someone in this room has it all together and is, has just arrived spiritually, you don't know them very well. Uh, we're sinners. We are broken and sinful people. But an amazing thing happens when you hang around church for a while, you hang around religious people, you actually start to think you do have it all together. You start acting like you've arrived spiritually. In other words, you go from being a tax collector to a Pharisee. You once knew the sinner you were and you thought God would never forgive you, and now you feel you're actually a really great person, and God's lucky to have you. 
And if we're not careful, we can quickly turn the church into a place where a few self-righteous people come to display their holiness to everyone instead of a hospital where sick people come to be healed. The church is supposed to be a place where sinners find grace, not judgment. It's true that we are to be holy. We are not to participate in sinful lifestyles. But that doesn't mean distancing ourselves from broken and hurting people. Let's not be Pharisees, criticizing from a distance. Let's be like Jesus, seeking out sinners who need help. Has your proximity to ostensibly sinful people ever caused others to criticize you? Or do you keep such a safe distance from those people that you have no risk of ever ever reaching or influencing them? If our text teaches us anything, it's that Jesus Christ came for sinners. And the further a person is enslaved to sin, the more likely they are to realize it and rejoice in the forgiveness of God. I want to close by reading uh, the words to a song that I think are very instructive for our church. I'd like for us to consider these. Souls on the street addicted to sin, selling themselves to survive, not understanding the hope they could find in a place where God's love is alive. They doubt that they could meet the standards necessary and feel that they'd find judgment rather than a sanctuary. This must be a place where the broken heart can mend. This must be a place where the outcast finds a friend. For we cannot lift the fallen if our hand still holds a stone. And their sin that seems so great to us is no greater than our own. There must be a point where shame meets grace, and this must be the place. Neighbor next door keeps the house looking good, but the home is collapsing within. Pressures of life pull a family apart, and temptation's destruction begins. They doubt the church could have the answers necessary, and they feel that they'd find rejection rather than a sanctuary. This must be a place where the broken heart can mend. This must be a place where the outcast finds a friend. We cannot lift the fallen if our hand still holds a stone, and their sin that seems so great to us is no greater than our own. There must be a point where shame meets grace, and this must be the place. The church must be the arms of God reaching out to bring them in to a place where they can find his love regardless of their sin. May Lakeshore Baptist Church be that place.